Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Hi, I'm Michael Duncan, and welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focused on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each of our guests. Our goal is to help the listeners learn how they can achieve their own financial freedom through the experience and stories of experts that have done just that. Today's guest is a recognized expert on the gold sector and is regularly used by IG Index and Stockhead, amongst others, for his view on the sector. He's also recently written a book, Investing in a Recession, Time to Think About Gold, which is a wonderful beginner's guide to investing in gold and can be found on brookvillecapital.com. I'm very excited to welcome Simon Popple to the show. Simon, how are you doing today? I'm very good. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, it's obviously, if you can tell by the sound of his voice and his accent, we are on a bit uh, of a different time zone today, which is very exciting. I'm going to do my best to not talk in a British accent at all during this episode, but no promises. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can promise you I'll have an English accent. And if I do an American one, you'll be absolutely appalled. So uh uh, let's let let's let's keep me English. <laughs> yes, let's uh yeah let's leave each other to uh, what we're best at. But uh, speaking of what we're best at, I'm really excited today uh, to talk to you about uh, your book, obviously, but also just your journey to how you got to investing in gold and making a career out of that. Uh, like I said, you you're a recognized expert. Um, you're viewed that way by many in the industry. Um, and I would love to just start by asking you, I guess how you got to the point where investing in gold is your main source of income. Yeah, well, I mean, my background was fairly typical in terms I did an MBA. I worked in the city in corporate finance. Uh, I was head of investment management at a company called Spreffs. And then I was uh, the youngest director of one of the the world's largest uh, private property businesses um, in my, in my thirties. And um to be honest, I you know I love property, um, and uh, but but I actually did a sort of calculation way back when um, about you know pensions and inflation, and I was slightly horrified about how inflation can impact uh, your kind of long term um, savings, you know, pension, whatever it is, and um, I sort of looked at you know perhaps ways that I could um, uh, you know perhaps mitigate. Uh, some of that risk, and one of one of those ways was to have some exposure to gold. So um, I looked looked into it more closely, and um, ended up jacking in my career in property, which at the time everyone thought was crazy, and um, got involved in commodities. And um, I invested, did well, and Money Week, which is a a popular um, weekly magazine over here in the UK, um, heard about what I was doing, and they asked me to write a newsletter. And then um, uh, that sort of spread to the US and Agora Financial, that's the, one of the world's largest newsletter businesses. Um, I got asked to write Gold Speculator uh, with a guy called Jim Rickards, who's, who's big in the in the US. And um, yeah, I, I've kind of got into it since then. And you know, I've just got dug deeper and deeper. And you know, the more I found, the the more exciting it became. Yeah, I, I mean, that's incredible. And your story just in general, uh, I, I've had the pleasure of, uh, I've begun reading your book, so I haven't read the whole thing yet. But um, uh, the beginning, you're talking about, you know, how schooling wasn't really for you, you didn't really seem to enjoy school. Um, and it wasn't until you noticed what your friends uh, were doing, and how much money they were making, frankly, uh, that you really, I kind of gather, got um, the inspiration to go for that MBA and learn more about what you could be doing. Is that right? Yeah, no, very much so. I mean, I, I think um, 
I probably learned a bit too late that that you know it's it's what you're passionate about that that sort of ends up defining your life. And um, rather bizarrely, you know, I, I used to play a lot of chess as a young kid, and um, I used to, uh, you know, if, if I if I kind of look in the rearview mirror. Um, you know, a lot of people I used to beat at chess, you know, went on to Oxford and Cambridge and top universities and got, got great results. But I was just never passionate about conventional education. So it was only really when, um, as you say, you know, I saw some some people I perhaps uh, didn't rate uh, massively highly um, being paid a lot of money that I suddenly thought, you know, perhaps I should uh, uh, pull up my socks and, um, uh, you know, do something about it. I I just have to say that I love uh, that term, pull up my socks. Uh, That is not something that I hear in the United States. (laughs) We're very pull up by our bootstraps or whatever, Uh, but pull up my socks. I think that's something I'm going to have to use uh, because I really enjoy that. Um, So you said it's, it's, it's about what, what you're passionate about. Um, What, and you told me beforehand you were very passionate about property and that's obviously kind of where you started uh your career and where you started this journey what was the main thing that you found in gold that you couldn't get from property well i i think that um property i, I saw interest rates going down and property is very much a leveraged uh, asset class so if interest rates are going down, then property becomes more affordable and therefore prices go up. And, you know, obviously we've seen that globally. Um, but I really wanted a, an asset class which was less exposed to um, interest rates. And although there's no perfect hedge for inflation, you know, gold is often viewed as a bit of a safe haven asset. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I think in these sort of um, challenging times, uh, you know, gold is, uh, is, you know, it's proven it's been around for thousands of years. It's pr- probably the only asset I can think of that is universally viewed yeah. as valuable and uh, not only universally viewed as valuable, but, you know, you can cut a gold bar in half and, um, you know, you still got the same amount of gold, whereas if you cut a diamond in half, um, you know, you have a dramatic impact on its value. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, attributes to gold that, uh, if I'm honest, you know, some of them I, I knew from day one, but the yeah. more I've researched it, the more I've found. And, um, you know, I'm very pleased I've chosen it as sort of my my area of, of sort of expertise. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine if you tried to cut a house in half, that would probably greatly damage the uh, property value of that. Yeah, I, I think you'd probably find the owner would be quite cross as well. Mm, yeah, so definitely a good a, a good call on that one. Uh, a very uh, a very good observation. Um, and so you make a really good point. Gold has been around for thousands of years. It's not something that you can just print out and change uh, like money in any part of the world, really. Um, why? I guess it might be a simple question, but why is that so important? as opposed to something like property? Well, I mean, let's do with money first, because you made a very good point that you can't print gold. And I think that, you know, don't get me wrong, fiat money is is fantastic, but uh, the fact you can print it, you know, it's a bit like having a cake. It doesn't matter how many times you slice it, it's still the same size cake. Yep. And I, I think that, you know, printing money, uh, it can be very, very good for liquidity, but um, the fact you can print it, um, is you know it's a strength and a weakness. Um, now you know going on to property, I think it, it, you know property is um, it, it depends very much on where the property is in terms of what its value is. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know if, if you've got a property in one city and you've got exactly the same property in, in a different city, they're worth different amounts of money. They probably cost you the same to build, but but um, they're worth very different amounts of money because the land is is worth different amounts of money. And um, I think that, um, you know, what I like about uh, about gold versus property is, uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't have any property. I've made decent money on property, so, you know, I sell our property. But um, what I like about gold is it's portable. And so, you know, if, uh, if, if for some reason I decide 
I want to go and live somewhere else. Um, I can't take my property with me, but I can take my gold. And um, so I, I think that um, I don't think there's one answer to any investing question, but I think that yeah. um, you need a sort of some diversification. You want um, water in different buckets. And I think one of those buckets is the gold bucket, which uh, you know very few people have. I think most people have got property, they've probably got equities, they've probably got bonds, um, which is which is fine. And I don't rubbish any of those categories, but but what I would say is, you know, you should look at gold as well. Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more. And it, it is valuable. It's it's recognized as valuable throughout the world. I mean, there's obviously just the general idea that yeah, you can move it, but it's also the fact that anywhere in the world gold is worth money. Um, so even if like, if you have something that's not valuable, or it's only valuable in certain parts of the world that you can move, it's not nearly as helpful as having something that is recognized as valuable throughout the whole world. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I just think it's, um, it's an asset class that um, very few people and I mean, very underlined in bold, have got any exposure to which is amazing. You know, it, it Gold has been around thousands of years, uh, and you would expect everyone to have some some in their portfolio, but um, very few people have. And even those who have, um, I don't think they they fully understand uh, the gold market, and therefore, um, you know, whether the holding they've got makes sense for you know for what they're looking for. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of the gold market, is it an easy thing to get involved in for beginners? It is. Um, I, I, I think the one of the key things to ask is, you know, what are you looking to get out of your investment? And it's a really simple question, but a lot of people probably don't have an answer to it. And it's, it's quite interesting because, you know, when I speak to people, they say, oh, I want the highest return possible. But if you want the highest return possible, then you probably want, you know, you, well, you don't say you want, but you'll have to take on quite a high degree of risk. And um, what I like about the market is, um you can take uh, you know a range of risk and uh you know so you you can take you know perhaps physical gold which is probably what i'd view as the lower risk yeah mm -hmm. now, in, in football analogy i'd probably view that as a stadium and then you could have major uh producers um that are probably more like your goalkeepers um or in American football term, I, I you know, <laughs> linebacker, I'm kind of guessing. Um, but then you've got um, defenders, which are uh, established, but not, not massive companies. These tend to be you know, a couple of billion dollars. Um, then you've got midfielders that are, that are new to um, uh, production or about to go into production. And then you've got explorers that are you know, your high risk uh, companies. And um, you know, you explore as a, I don't know, perhaps your I don't know, wide receivers or or something like that. But I mean, I think the, the point I'm making is to to be successful, you want to have a team. You and you can't have a team which is all linebackers or all wide yeah. receivers. You need um, people in every position. And I think that's one of the things that people miss when they invest in the market. They think, oh, I'm just going to get some gold, um, but that's that's not really how to make the most of the opportunity. So I guess what what would you suggest is a good way to get started then? I mean, we've talked about obviously having a diversified portfolio is important when it comes to gold. So how do you recommend people start kind of figuring out what that portfolio should contain? Well, I, I think that what you need to do is you need to um, – uh, look at again what you're looking to achieve yeah um but you know to start off with you need to have an account uh with um a brokerage you know and if you one misconception people have is you know i don't want gold bars lying around the house but you don't have gold bars lying around <laughs> the house you, you 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 know you buy stuff and you, and you and you store it with um uh with people so i i think it's you know it's really important to um to understand the the the, the sort of the nuances of, of how the market works and uh, you know once once you've got some physical gold which i view as as let's say the foundations of your house mm -hmm. then you can look at perhaps getting some uh, some some of the majors 
uh, which are like the really, really big global goal companies. Um, and and then perhaps defenders, midfielders, and forwards. But but you kind of you build your house up, and you you don't necessarily go for the riskiest stuff first. You go for the safer stuff, and then as you get to know the market better, um, and you've already got your money in in the safer stuff, then you can you can you can build out, and um, you know perhaps have. You know, I, I picked a company called Chalice Gold uh, a couple of years ago that went from fifteen cents to over ten bucks super high risk but you know phenomenal returns when you get it right but um i wouldn't go and buy chalice as my first investment you know that's yeah. something you buy when you when you, you're more experienced yeah if you don't have the foundations correct then your house is probably going to come crumbling down most of the time exactly and it's it, it, there's there's a process and I, I i strongly you know suggest people um follow a process and um and get something that uh, you know is a portfolio that, that that's right for them. You know, that's ultimately what you're looking to do. Absolutely. Um, and something that's it's interesting. Just as you're talking about it, it seems as though you might view gold as almost a form of an insurance as well as an investment, uh, just in the way that it kind of exists in. Uh, exists within investing as compared to some other alternatives yeah no i think that's very true and i mean i think that's that's why i'd suggest that you perhaps start off with you know physical gold and producers because um with physical gold i mean the average all in sustainable costs of, of actually producing it tends to be around 12 to 1200 bucks and the gold price nearest down it's sort of two thousand bucks so yes there is downside but you know i would view the downside as probably not much more than eight hundred dollars uh, yeah. per ounce because um it, it, if you get below that level a lot of companies will stop producing and therefore the price will you know automatically correct um whereas i see the upside um is you know unlimited and you know, given that gold has been with us for probably millions of years, um, I don't think you know any more is going to be be made. Yes, some will be more, some more will be found, but but uh, it's becoming more and more expensive, and difficult to find. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I think that uh, there is a real sort of intrinsic value that um, you know investors should should think about. Yeah, I mean, at its core, it is a it's a finite resource. I mean that is the main di- like that uh, that at the core of all of this that's the main difference between gold and housing or stocks or whatever else you choose to invest in like this is a finite resource that is found on this planet and short of uh you know obviously my background on um, this zoom call is space uh and short of leaving earth uh as far as we know this is a finite resource and that in itself makes it um it does have a sort of built in insurance of it because of the finiteness of it i'm not really sure if that's a word but i'm going to go with it no no i, I think i think i think it's very true and i mean I, th- I think the the other thing i like about it is you know uh, obviously we've got a world of worry and things are you know uh, concerning uh, for for all of us and um if the world corrects itself you can sell the gold back yeah and um so uh, you know, there aren't many insurance policies where you can turn around and say, well, actually, uh, thank you, but you can have it back and I want Very money. True. Um, and so, you know, I do like that, that fact that you can, you can buy it. Um, and it, you know, hopefully it goes up in value. And if it does, then you may want to view it as an investment, but if, if it sort of stays there or, you know, even goes down in value, um, at least you can view yourself as having a form of insurance, which, um, you know, I, I I think is is quite unique. It absolutely is unique. Um, just you know, comparing it to the other conversations I've had with people, it's um, and obviously as I'm learning more about investing in general, it just it is it does exist in its own. I mean, its own sector, but it's also it just exists in its own world in a lot of ways, which I find extremely interesting. And uh, one of the things you mentioned early on in your book is that a big part of the reason that you moved from property uh, to gold 
was you were thinking about retirement. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, at Cam Plan, we are a self-directed IRA administrator. Um, we focus on using people's retirement uh, savings to invest in things to help them retire well. And that struck a chord with me in your book because you're talking about, hey, and I don't want to misquote you, uh, but I really liked when you said, I don't, I want to live, I don't want to exist. Yeah. Meaning that you just, you, you want money to be able to live and not just money to get by. Well, no, exactly. I mean, here, here in the UK, our February inflation figure came out today, which I think was 10.2%, um, which is really scary. Yeah. And um, I, I think a big misconception that people have is, um, you know, they probably got, let's say, I don't know, two and a half percent on their deposit um, with a bank or government, whatever it was. Um, and, you know, if, they, if inflation was running at two percent, then they actually made half a percent. Yeah. Um, so their purchasing power increased by half a percent a year. But if if you can get, let's say, I don't know, five, six percent nowadays, um, but if inflation is running at 10.2, you know, you're losing at least 4% a year yeah. in your purchasing power. And I think there's this sort of fool's paradise where people actually feel wealthy because they're making five, six, whatever it is, percent. But the reality that people need to think about is if, if inflation, is, inflation is higher than the return you're getting on uh, your money, you're actually losing money. And um, whilst, as I say, there's no perfect way of of hedging that. Yeah. Um, I think that people, you know, they should look at having at least some gold in their portfolio to uh, to try and protect themselves. So, for the listeners, why does gold help protect them from that? You know, why why does that not? Why does inflation not affect gold the same way? Well, I, I think. What you need to do is look at the book, and in the book, I give a lot of examples of market corrections, and also, uh, you know, you can look at gold in times of, of higher inflation, you know, particularly sort of the late seventies, early eighties. And um, as I say, there's no perfect hedge for inflation, um, but I think that uh, having some gold in your portfolio um, historically has been you know very useful in times of higher inflation and um i i would suggest people at least look at it uh, because if it can help them uh, you know if you've got bonds that are let's say paying you you know two percent a year and inflation's running at 10 um you know you yes you get your money back but it's worth a lot less yeah. uh, and, and so you know that's what i like about having some gold in the portfolio um because you know you would hope that um even though gold doesn't yield anything like a bond does um uh, at least if if the value of it goes up um then you've got a degree of protection um you know against inflation absolutely um i think that makes a lot of sense um and so we have talked a little bit about you know the, that first, I want to say you said like 10 to 12 years uh, where you might have felt a little stupid or it looked like you had made a mistake or whatever. Um, and something I love to ask people on this podcast is about the mistakes that they've made along the way and how that's helped them in the future uh, adjust and learn more and learn from those mistakes to make better choices in the future. Could you talk to me a little bit about um, you know, anything that maybe you learned a lot from? Uh, as you kind of moved from property to gold and really changed what you did with your life in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made was um, you only make money when you sell. And that um, is true. You know, uh, when you buy something, you know, the value can go up or down and um, you only crystallize the loss when you sell or the gain when you sell. And I think it works both ways. You know, you when you when you make an investment, I think you have to accept you're never going to be 100 percent right, and that's actually quite damaging for your ego. Um, yeah. But you know, especially as a professional investor, 
you don't think when well, I did all the research, you know, I would normally do and I got it wrong. But I think you have to be quite humble about investing and accept you'll never get everything right. But um, if things go really well, you know, like Chalice, for example, um, you know, at one point I was making or losing an awful lot of money each, each evening. And psychologically, that's very difficult to deal with. Yeah. You know, when you've lost enough money that you could buy a really nice car or you've made an, uh, enough money that you could buy a nice car. And um, I think that, um, you know, the first thing I did was, uh, you know, when it got to a certain level, I just, I just sold. Um, did I max out? No, I didn't. But I did make an awful lot of money. Um, likewise, you know, sometimes if you make a bad decision, um, it's painful, but you should sell as well. And, um, you know, if, if you see a stock go down, it may be because of the market, in which case, you know, you, your view may be that the market will come back, but it may be very pertinent to that stock, in which case you perhaps think, well, you know, I'll, you know, I, I made a bad call on it and I'll sell. So, um, I, I think that you you do need to be quite humble about your investments. Now, that's a it's a big mistake that that I made. You know, going back to you know, the original question, that I think that you know when you when you make an investment, um, you have to accept you're not always going to be right. And yeah. I think you have to personally. I don't like putting stop losses in because the market's so volatile. Uh, you know, it, it can trip a stop loss quite easily. Um, with, without you intending it to, but um, but I think you know if you do get it wrong, you need to kind of stick up your hand and go, yeah, I got it wrong, and and sell. But similarly, if you get it right, I'd say um, don't be too greedy. You know, you need yeah. to understand why you got it right. And um, there's a lovely quote. I'm going to try and remember it. It said that don't think you're smart when you're lucky. And um, there are occasions where with mining. Particularly, you know, you you, you 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 buy into a company because you think it's got great gold prospects, and then um, the gold prospects don't work out, and then they find a massive amount of lithium or something like that, and uh, you know the share price can go absolutely mental. And if that's the case, um, even though it can be very nice for you for, as a shareholder, um, you you do need to kind of understand. That it's yeah. luck rather than intelligence has got you there, and um, uh, you know act accordingly. But yeah, I, I think selling is very important as well as buying. You need to buy smart, but you need to sell smart as well. And I think that uh, um, a lot of rookie rookie investors, um, you know, they can buy. You know, they're quite good at buying, but you need to be good at selling as well. Yeah, buying's easy. I mean, it's just a button. But when you see that money going up or down, I mean, it's it's a lot harder to press that button. Um, and I, I think you make a, a really great point there when you mention the fact that, you know, just if you don't sell, then you haven't made the money. You know, it doesn't matter how high that gets if you never press sell, because that can very just as easily, just as quickly turn into a loss. So if you're not confident, if, if you're not capable of pressing the sell button when you're up you know, 80% or whatever. Yeah, sure. Maybe it goes up to 100% or maybe it drops down to, you know, minus 80% by the next day. Like you need to be just on, just as on top of it as you are when you're buying. I, I think that's so true. And, you know, going back to property, I think, you know, people have made huge amounts of money in property over the last 10, 20 years. Now, if they sold, um, they've done phenomenally well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if they haven't sold, you know, they, they they may find the market, you know, it shot up and they could find it shooting down again. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but you see that kind of thing and everything like, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand. I, I'm very into American uh, football, uh, fantasy football and all that. And as odd as it may seem, there's a lot of that in fantasy football as well. And just hedging your bets on a player performing well and then admitting when you're wrong. Because you can maybe sell before anyone else realizes that something's going wrong. And, you know, maybe you don't get back what you put into it, but at least you get something out of it. You know, you're not taking a 100% loss, you're taking a 50% loss or something like that. Knowing when to sell is just as important. So I, I really couldn't agree with you more on all that. 
that, 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 that's why I like using the, the fancy football uh, analogy as well, because yeah. you know you can get players that get injured. So you get a company that on the face of it is a perfectly good company and then something happens. And, you know, I, I view that as perhaps an injury. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would sell um, the company and um, uh, it, it's kind of like it hurts because you could sell at 50, 60 percent loss. But if you get it right, and as I say, you know, Chalice went up 65 times. So yeah. if you get it right um, more than you get it wrong, uh, you can still make a lot of money. Yeah. And it hurts. I mean, it hurts when it's something that you put your time and your belief into. And it is very hard to admit when you're wrong. But ultimately, you know, I think you're right that the person that is willing to admit they're wrong and able to admit they're wrong is the person that's going to win more often than the person that, you know, maybe gets lucky once, um, but won't admit that they're wrong or right in certain scenarios. Um, so I, I think that's all very well said. And uh, finally, before I let you tell me all about your book and where, uh, sorry, that I let you, you tell the listeners all about your book and where uh, they can find it, um, I'd just like to simply ask, what does financial freedom mean to you? I, I think financial freedom means uh, really making your own decisions um, uh, on, on your own terms. And um, I think some people can do that, but not everyone can do that. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean having a huge amount of money. I just think it means having enough money for you to do what you want to do. And, yeah. um, you know, for some people, they may not want to do a huge amount that, that costs a lot of money, in which case they've got financial freedom. Uh, if you have got, let's say, more money, but you've got massive aspirations to have a big boat or have a big house, um, you may not have got financial freedom. So I think it's it, it's really about having enough money to live life on the terms that, that are going to make you happy. Very well said. Uh, very well said. Um, now, please uh, feel free to plug yourself to the listeners. Tell all the listeners where they can read your book. Um, like I said, I've begun reading it. I'm really enjoying it, uh, and I'm looking forward to finishing it. So please tell the listeners all about it and where they can learn more about you or get connected with you. Well, I think probably the best starting point is my website. If you go to www.brookvillecapital.com, uh, you can find out more about what I'm doing. Um, I've got the book if you want to uh, look into that. Um, and I also have a gold program, which uh, to be honest, I'd suggest you read the book first before you, you dive into that. But um, it, the book really is a beginner's guide to to investing in gold. Um, so uh if if you've had no exposure to to the sector already um you know i'd recommend you know you, you at least have a think about it and um to be honest even if, even if you're an experienced investor in the sector um the, the, there's probably some parts of it that are a bit like looking in the rear view mirror um uh, but um i'd be surprised if it's all like that and so uh you know i, I think it's uh it's certainly worth a read and uh i'll quick look behind uh the curtain, something you mentioned to me before, I believe it was before we were recording, which is that you're still learning. Like you, there are parts of the book that, you know, you would just, after doing this for so long, you have just kind of discovered the best way to kind of put into words and the best, um, you know, the be uh, so, some of the best lessons that have come out of all of this, you've only learned in the past couple of months. So I think even for experience, you know, it is a beginner's guide, but also there are things that you're still learning that are in there. Uh, no, absolutely, and, and it's it's you know as you rightly say it's, it really is a beginner's guide, but it's only when you you try and break something down so it's understandable to someone who's perhaps less familiar that you actually learn quite a lot of stuff yourself, um, because there's a lot of uh, kind of assumed knowledge. And um, when when people say, well, actually, I don't understand that, which forces you to to explain it more clearly. Uh, in explaining it more clearly, you have a better understanding yourself. So, um, you know, I, I love the fact that. Um, in, you know, I, I haven't, I, I keep digging and digging, researching, researching. I'm very passionate about the sector, um, but I haven't found anything yet that, um, that's put me off it, which is great. So, um, uh, I think, I think this, you know, the more learning I do, the more I enjoy it. And if I'm honest, the more I realize there's, uh, you know, there's more, more, more to be done. It's funny how things change. You know, we started out by talking about how you, you were not a fan of education and now, but it's all about learning what you're passionate about. So uh, exactly. that's awesome to hear. Uh, and that is brookvillecapital.com. That will be linked in the description of this episode. 
Um, Simon, thank you so much for hopping on. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I'm very excited to get to reading the rest of your book uh, and talking with you in the future. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. And as always, thanks for listening to The Road to Financial Freedom. If you enjoyed this show, please support the podcast by remembering to rate, review, and subscribe. You can keep up to date with us on Facebook or Instagram at Road to Financial Freedom Podcast. Thanks again, and I will see you next time. If you like what you're hearing on The Road to Financial Freedom and want to learn more about self-directed IRAs and 401ks, click the link in the description to download a free toolkit with everything you need to get started.